Good evening, everyone. All right, so I'm kind of getting a little used to the newer schedule here, or so it is at least for right now until it changes again, where we're meeting together at six at night here. Um, you know, I was kind of kicking around an idea about an hour ago. Uh, you know, what, what should we talk about tonight? And uh, I was talking to my wife about it, and she was like, you know, maybe we ought to talk, you ought to talk about the will of God or the plans of God. And I was like, oh, I've talked about the will of God quite a bit. Um, we've, we've talked about that, and we I think we all know the answer to that. It's Jesus tells us what the will of God is. He says, My Father's will is that anyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That is the will of God. Uh, there is no, it's not a situational thing where are you in God's will or are you not in God's will? Is this God's will? Is that God's will? That's all gobbledygook. Um, according to the New Testament, the will of God is that you be in the Son, that you be in Christ. Um, so there's no anxiety about the will of God. There isn't. Uh, when we go to the scriptures, it's, this is cut and dry. I mean, so that makes verses like... Um, uh, <clears throat> the like what we have in First John, where it says, whoever does the will of God lives forever. Um, that makes that pretty understandable and, and very relaxing because we're like, okay, we've done that. Uh, that makes uh, chapters like Matthew 7, where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but only he who does the will of my Father. But when we have that answer, none of that's, that's not frightening. Okay, well, we know what the will is and we've, we've done. We've done the Father's will. We've looked to the Son and we've believed in him. It's not a bunch of little things we have to do. It's one thing. It's one, uh, it's the work of God to believe in the Son. So we've talked about that a ton. We've talked about the will of God a ton. Um, what about the plan of God? Because that's a whole other element, isn't it? And I, <clears throat> I kind of remember that being used the same way. Is it was, um, well, maybe this wasn't God's plan. Maybe that wasn't God's plan. Um, are you sure that what you're doing is God's plans? Um, you know, are, are you, is this your plans or is it God's plans? And it essentially got used the exact same way, almost interchangeably with the will of God. So I thought, let's talk about the plan of God. And what does the New Testament say about that? What does the Old Testament say about it? Because almost everything I've ever heard with God's plans or the plan of God or who, however we're going to phrase that uh, comes from the Old Testament, um, almost exclusively. So let's start out there. And just kind of read a few Old Testament scriptures that talk about a plan and, and God a little bit, you know, and maybe this is God's plan or it's somebody else's plan and God's involved, however that may be. So let's kind of get an Old Testament idea of that. And then let's look at what the New Testament says and can kind of compare them and just see, okay, so what, what exactly is the plan here? What was this? So kind of to start out, um, where, you know, the most famous verse, the most famous verse, whenever the plans of God, plan of God is going to be discussed is, of course, Jeremiah 29, 11. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster to give you a future and hope in a hope. Okay. And that is on all of our, we got that on Christian merch. We got that on coffee mugs. We got that on pillows. Um, when I was younger, we had that on a plaque in my dining room. Um, that is a popular, popular verse. It is used, it, it is used any way we like, um, spoken to anyone we like. Uh, but what's the context there? Well, let's pull it up. Let's read the verse right before that. Okay. For this is what the Lord says. When the 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you to fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for prosperity and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. Okay, so the context to that is not God speaking to us not God speaking in general about all humans. He has plans for all humans, and um, he knows that, and their plans to prosper and not to harm. Uh, it's, it's not that at all. This is about the Babylonian exile and the remnant of Israel. That's the context here. Um, when the time in Babylon, when the 70 years are, are completed, um, God's saying, I'm going to come back. I'm going to bring you back to this place. Israel was, um, in, in 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah was wiped out by the Babylonian Empire, and they, well, many of them were hauled off to Babylon as political prisoners, okay? Fifty years later, and interesting that it says 70 years here, um, officially, from what I understand, officially the exile was actually 50 years, but an additional 20 years was tacked onto that, um, I think the original invasion of Babylon was in uh, like 592 or something. And somehow we, we end up with 70 and 50 for both of these. Um, it's really referring to the same amount of time. Um, it just depends on how you look at it. Either way, Israel was in exile for 50 years in Babylon. 
And what you have God saying here is when that time is up, I'm going to return to you and I'm going to bring you back to, I'm going to bring you back to Judah. The temple is going to be rebuilt. And that is what's being talked about there through the prophet Jeremiah. Okay. This is not a generalization to every human ever. Um, that God's saying, I have, I know the plans I have for you and the way that we use it. That's just not the context there. This is about the remnant of Israel coming back from exile in Babylon. Um, also, it's not really good news, honestly, um, you know, to, to apply this kind of to everyone. Well, the middle part's okay, but the, the first part's pretty dark. I mean, the Babylonian invasion of Jerusalem was a horrific event. If you read the Book of Lamentations, the saddest book in the entire Bible, um, read the descriptions there of what went on when the Babylonians had surrounded Jerusalem. They starved them out. They encamped around the city for two years. They starved them out to the point where cannibalism became a thing. I mean, this is a really negative story here. And that's actually what's being referenced um, at the beginning of this verse. And God's saying, look, I, I have plans not to harm you, but to bring you back and for you to prosper um, in light of what has just happened here. So this really, really dark, horrific event, then we get to the exile of Judah into Babylon. Then we get to the restoration of the remnant of Israel, which is what he's mentioning. That's the plans that he has is to restore Israel. But at the end, he says, then you will call upon me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. Meaning he wasn't listening in the, like, the rest of the time. They, they were, there was actually a judgment that had been issued for the sins of Judah. So none of this is good news and none of it has a, a drop of gospel in it. Um, none. Um, there's not a drop of grace here or anything like that. Uh, so, but that's kind of that's kind of the verse. That's the go-to verse when it talks about plans. Is, is the Jeremiah 29:11 uh, ripping it completely out of its context and using it any way we like? So that can't be it. Um, as far as like, what is God's plan? It can't be that. That was a plan that was in the past for Judah, absolutely. But is that the universal thing we can say for every human? You know, God has plans for you to prosper. Um, no, uh, that's, again, that is completely and totally out of context there. Uh, it would, would it be an unreasonable thing to say? I don't think so. But here's the thing. We would be saying that. Scripture isn't saying that. So while it might not be unreasonable to say that, um, that is just how not how that's used. So there's that. That's the most famous one. Let's look at some other ones here. Just kind of going through the Old Testament here. Um, you get a lot of talks about plans in uh, Psalms and Proverbs. So let's just visit a couple of those. Um, let me find some here specifically that talk about God, though, because I saw a couple when I was um, when I when I was uh, I was browsing through this. Uh, here's one that's interesting. This is Proverbs sixteen nine, and this is what it says: The mind of a person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. I thought that was a little interesting. And you can find several examples of this in Psalms and Proverbs where you have people are making plans, but ultimately it doesn't, it's all for naught because God is in control of absolutely everything. Um, find that interesting because of kind of what we talked about uh, recently about free will. And it's it's just not a biblical concept. You know, if if free will truly stood kind of the world philosophy of it, the way that we teach it, if that was true, um, a person would make the plans and then carry them out and God wouldn't interfere at all. But what we see consistently throughout the Old Testament and, and, and even in the New Testament is that that's not really the case. Um, you have people devising plans and you actually have God changing the plans. Um, he's actually stepping into the story and altering it. And we, we have that throughout all the scripture. So just, just more of that. Uh, as far as God's plans, um, is there anything that talks about that? There's a little bit, uh, not too much in the Old Testament. Here's one, though. This is Isaiah 25.1. Um, it says, Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Um, Isaiah speaking of God having plans that were formed long ago and he's working through them. So things are mentioned. Uh, there's, there's some more mentions of things like that uh, as, as we, if we you know, browse through the Old Testament, primarily in Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, not really a definition, though. Not really a definition, uh, kind of more of a generalization uh, use there. All of that being said, um, I'm not sure there, since there's not really a definition, I'm not sure if I would go to that and use it in any way. Uh, because when we did have the definition, it was pretty negative for the Babylonian exile. When we don't have a definition, um, maybe the psalmist or Solomon or whoever is writing is just saying, look, the Lord has plans. These are good plans from long ago, but they're not really telling us what these are. Um, you know, we could we could step into that and define it and, and kind of make it whatever we want, but it it's really not defined there. So not something I would probably 
use a bunch or teach from. That's just me personally, though. But this gets a little bit more interesting when we move into the New Testament, because the New Testament seems to have a definition to it um, as far as God's plan. The first one that I found was this, okay? This I thought was interesting. It popped into my head, and I couldn't remember exactly where it was, but I looked it up and I did find it. Um, this is, comes from Acts chapter 2. This is from Peter's speech that he gives after receiving the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, Peter is like a theological wizard. This was the guy that couldn't tell like his head from his behind when it came to the scriptures, and he receives the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, he's just like, well, this is exactly what was spoken of in the past. And he's going on and on about uh, quoting the Old Testament left and right, but um, it just is a testament to the power of the Holy Spirit within a person, because Peter certainly was not like that before. Uh, but at any rate, he's addressing this crowd. You know, you've had the believers speak in tongues. People have said that they're drunk. Um, it's, it's a strange thing, and people kind of want to know what's going on. So Peter stands up, and he starts addressing the, these people gathered here. Something interesting he says here, uh, he says, This man, speaking about Jesus, was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him from the dead, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So kind of the first mention that you have in the New Testament of a plan of God is actually the death of Jesus. Um, he said, Peter is saying this was actually God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge. Uh, not only did he plan on this happening, he had the foreknowledge of it. Um, that's that's actually defined in saying that this was a plan of God's. Is this the plan of God's, I wonder, though? You know, is, was this always the plan? Is this plan with a capital P? Um, well, at least we have a definition there. And the definition of that would be that Jesus died. Uh, that's the plan. Um, but he was raised again. He was raised again, uh, all being the plans of God. So uh, going on here a little bit more, um, let's, let's look at it. We got a few more uh, definitions here I think would be good to look at. <clears throat> um, where did I find this? Oh, okay, I remember where it's at. It's in Ephesians. Um, Ephesians mentions a plan of God, I think, three different times in the book of Ephesians. So let's pull up the first mention, and it's right at the opening of Ephesians. I think it's verse 9. Is it verse 9? It's verse 10. This is what it says. Um, of course, you have Paul's greeting, grace and peace to you, all of that. But then he says this, speaking of the Father, he says, He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he set forth in him, regarding his plan of the fullness of the times to bring together in Christ all things, in the heavens and things on the earth. So, mentioning the plan of God there, and he's saying it was his plan that in Christ he would reconcile to himself all things. Reconcile is kind of how other translations will put that, saying according to his plan, it was always the plan to reconcile all created things together in Christ. Um, so does that link, you know, what we just read in Acts when we're saying that, you know, Peter was saying the plan and foreknowledge of God was for Jesus to be killed, to be nailed to a cross, actually. He puts it that way, and he says, but also to be raised. Um, that was actually the plan of God. And here you have Paul saying this, the mystery of his will, this plan was actually um, to bring all things together in Christ, to reconcile all things to God through Christ, um, which could only happen through his death and resurrection. So um, that might be the same thing. I think that might be two different ways of saying the exact same thing there. Perhaps Jesus, his death and his resurrection and the reconciliation of created things is the plan of God. Um, but let's keep going, because I think that the more that we see this, especially in Ephesians, the more it kind of props that up a little bit. Um, so uh, verse 11 here, um, actually just branching off what we just read, uh, it says, In him we have also obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with the plan of his will. Um, really speaking, you know, you know Paul's a, a Jew, but really whenever you see predestination, this is referencing the Gentiles being brought in to the new covenant. Um, that's what predestination is. It's uh, that that when God made his promise to Abraham, he said all peoples on earth will be blessed through you um, and through your seed. This is 430 years before the law was given, but God is already speaking of the full inclusion of the Gentiles. Everyone was predestined to be included in Christ, to be blessed through the seed of Abraham. Um, forgiveness of sins comes through Jesus Christ, and it was for everyone. Uh, so that's really what predestination is. I know all the bad versions of it that are out there, uh, but that's not, I mean, it's it's only shows up in the New Testament like three or four times, and it always means that. It's talking about the mystery of Christ, that the Gentiles would be included. Well, actually, really, that everyone would, that there would be a new humanity. Um, every Jew and Gentile, the law would be abolished. They would be brought together. But again, this is kind of referred to as the fullness of God's plan was for this to happen. 
Um, and this is all in Christ. This is all accomplished in Christ. So I'm seeing a theme in the New Testament. When the plan of God is actually brought up, it has everything to do with Jesus every time we see that. Um, Going down here a little bit in chapter 3, uh, the mystery of God is actually referred to as a plan. Uh, let me read, starting in verse 8. So let's look at chapter 3, verse 8. Um, Paul's talking about himself. And he's saying, to me, the very least of saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of this mystery is, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things a mystery of Christ, that all everyone would be included, predestination, really almost interchangeable terms. Uh, but again, this is referred to as this age-old long plan of God's, uh, this long-standing plan, and it kind of all came to head in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, so I think the mention in Acts and these Ephesians ones, in my opinion, work pretty well together. And then there's just one more mention in the epistles, and that's it, of, of the plan of God. And this is what it says. This is 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 3. It starts in verse 3 here. Um, Paul's talking to Timothy, and he says this. He says, Just as I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia to remain in Ephesus, so that you would instruct certain people not to teach strange doctrines, nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to useless speculation, rather than advance the plan of God, which is by faith. So I urge you now. Um, He's saying, don't pay attention to these useless genealogies. Um, a lot of people think that that could be a reference. Well, Jews love genealogies, um, but the, the book of Enoch has a humongous genealogy in it. Uh, could be a reference to that. Uh, could be a reference to any of the Jewish genealogies, of which there are plenty. Um, regardless, he's saying, get, 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 stop, stop with the genealogies. You want to bore someone to death, like hit them with the genealogy. Um, it's useless. Um, strange doctrines are something that's anti-grace. Um, the reason... I think the reason we know that is because in Hebrews, um, the author says it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace and not to um, uh, not to be uh, pay, pay attention to all kinds of strange teachings. I believe he says right after that. Um, so that's I kind of always look at that and I say, well, strange teachings seem to be something that isn't grace. It's a strange teaching. That's usually how I'll, I'll use that. Um, but regardless, he's saying don't teach strange doctrine. Uh, well, urge people not to teach strange doctrines or these endless genealogies, um, but uh, they're just going to create speculation and it's not going to advance this plan of God, which is by faith. Faith in who? Jesus Christ. Um, so I see a theme and that's it. Incidentally, that's that's all the mentions of plan in the epistles. We hit them all. Um, but they all have they all have something in common there, don't they? Where it's, you have this plan of God being presented. This is something very old, something that's that God has been doing since the dawn of time. But it all was fulfilled in one person who is Jesus. And that's what we're seeing. Um, and that's kind of the way I feel about it. As far as what, you know, kind of to go with the title here, what exactly is the plan of God? Well, that Jesus, Jesus is the plan of God. Uh, similar to the will of God, but but everything that happened in the past and all coming to fulfillment in Jesus Christ, I believe that was that is the plan of God. That was, that is the plan of God. Um, whatever tense we want to put that in. And I can see criticisms to that. Um, well, to the whole thing, but I can see criticisms a little bit because here's what I could imagine criticizing. Uh, I could imagine criticizing this idea this way. Um, okay, so if the plan of God was always that we be in Christ, um, you know, if it, if that's that was always the plan, what about Adam? So was it always God's plan for Adam to make the wrong decision? and eat from the tree and plunge the entire world into darkness to allow sin and death and everything that happened. Was that the plan of God? If the, the plan is, is Christ and it's kind of an eternal plan, then, you know, was that the plan of God? Um, it's hard to answer that. I think that what I would say is he certainly planned on it. Um, he certainly planned on that happening. Whether or not, I would say he didn't want to, he didn't want Adam to do that. Um, he didn't want him to. He didn't force him to. Um, but did he plan on Adam making that decision before even creating the world? Yeah, because we have scripture that says that. Um, what is it? It's First or Second Timothy that says the grace was given to us before the world began, uh, but now it's been revealed in these last times. Grace was given to us before the world began, kind of placing this as an eternal thing. Uh, Revelation says the Lamb of God was slain before the creation of the world. Uh, so 
yes, uh, you know, God having infinite foreknowledge, um, I think he, he would have planned on it, at least. He would have planned on Adam doing this. Um, was it his plan for Adam to do it? Uh, that's that's a hard question to answer. It, it, that really is. Uh, but I, I I'm in this uh, Bible study currently, where there's uh, there's people that ask questions like that a lot because almost almost like they're suspicious of God. You know, like are, are we sure this isn't the the word I keep hearing thrown around in the Bible study is an experiment? Are we sure we're not just some experiment? Did God just get bored and he you know he did these things that um, that's the kind of conversations we're having? And um, I think we just it's got to go back to we just got to go back to scripture on it. But as far as the eternal plan being Jesus, being Jesus coming into the world, doing what he did. Um, I think that makes sense. Uh, we don't really need that if there isn't sin. You know, if Adam didn't do what he did, if there, we would have never needed a, a last Adam if the first Adam had actually uh, believed God. Uh, but I think, again, you know, God knowing all things, having having the foreknowledge that he has, um, yeah, I would say that he the plan would have been for everything to happen as it did, Jesus to come into the world, to 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 be born, to die, to be raised again. Um, and for us to be in Christ, that would have all been the plan. Um, you know, it, but it just it just becomes complicated when we say, well, but did God, was it was it his plan for Adam to do what he did? Um, he definitely planned on it. That's that would be my answer for it. He definitely he definitely planned for that to happen. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's tough. Um, and cause I can see that where some folks might say, well, that, that almost puts a bad, that like puts a bad light in, like, you know, shines a bad light on God or something like that. I can see, I can see people saying that. Um, cause again, that's, that's the kind of conversations we've been having in our, um, in our Bible studies. We've been having those kind of conversations, but, um, I don't know. I, other, other than you know, what we have in scripture, I'm not sure that we have that answer. Um, does God is part of his plans, bad things like is our you know our bad things part of it um, i don't i don't know i would say no but i think that he plans on them and then he works his grace um through them um you know that I, that's what i would say to it but i'd probably have to study that a little bit more um so that uh you know the plans of god are you in god's plan are you not in god's plan what are his plans uh it's, it's an anxiety thing right um, that's at least that's how it was always taught to me is it was a kind of an anxiety thing. It's we don't know God's plans. God's plans are some giant enigma. Like we have no idea what he's planning. Um, we just have to have more faith. You know, it's going to have more faith. And we're eventually, you know, something's going to become more evident here, um, just like the will of God. But both of those things, I think, that can be answered with Jesus. Um, Jesus says the will of God is that we're in Christ. The plan of God was that Christ came to us. Uh, to save us. That's really what the New Testament says there. So uh, room for anxiety, I, I really don't find it. Um, I personally don't really find it with either one of those things. Honestly, I think that when we shift our focus away from, I don't want to say us, but like when we shift it onto the Son of God and realize that everything that was in the, written in the past was about him, everything. Now, um, this was all, again, about one person. The gospel is the story of, Je you know, the, the gospel, well, the Bible is the story of Jesus Christ. I'll put it that way. Um, when we realize that, uh, there's just really not a lot of room for fear or anxiety, at least at least regarding that, at least regarding our salvation, at least regarding our, our Father, you know, at least regarding God. Uh, there's, not, there's not really any fear. We're not worried about repercussions anymore. We're not worried, oh, what if I don't do this? What if I do this wrong? What if I say this wrong? You know, is God mad at me? Is this, a, you know, all, all the kind of the things that religion teaches, um, they're just, they just don't work in light of Christ. Um, I think that's why he's so minimized in our, in our teachings. I think that's why he's so little in our Christian teachings, because he doesn't fit. You know, if you if you put the Son of God in there into the stuff that we teach, it like blows it up. Um, I, I I don't know if I told you guys this. I've, I've mentioned this uh, before to, uh, to different friends of mine. I don't know if I've shared this with you guys or not, um, but Bible study I was in a long time ago. Um, I was teach, teaching grace um, in kind of um, a more legalistic environment. And I, you know, kept doing it, kept doing it. I'm doing nothing but teaching on the cross, nothing but teaching on the new covenant, because that's what they didn't understand. You know, they they were going everywhere else with it besides besides the cross. And um, eventually, <clears throat> pardon me. Eventually, somebody said to me, they said, you know, if if Jesus really took away sins, all of them, past, present, and future, once for all time, because I had showed this person many times in the scriptures where it says once for all time, because they didn't believe that. 
Um, but, you know, after they had seen it so many times and I talked about it so many times, it was starting to get into their head a little bit. Um, but they said, if Jesus really did take away all sins uh, for everyone, once for all time, then that ruins everything. It just ruins everything. That's what they said. They said, they said it ruins everything. And I was like, well, you know, kind of like elaborate on that a little bit. What is it ruin? And uh, the person was saying what everything they've been taught, everything they believed is absolutely ruined by that. If Jesus actually took away sins once for all time. And that's the problem with him. That's the problem with the son of God. That's why it's hard to fit him into our, into our teachings. That's why it has to be a different Jesus. We have to change him in order to make him fit. Uh, because a, a full a full pardon of sin, full sanctification, actual righteousness, justification, glorification, um, everything that the New Testament speaks of does not work with faith plus works. It doesn't work with that. It doesn't work with mixed covenant theology. It doesn't work. Uh, so we have to change that message. And these are all positional things. These are things that are far off. Well, yes, you know, Jesus does take away your sins, Um and in the future, you're going to be sinless. You know, eventually you're going to be sinless. You're going to be perfect in the future. Um, but not now. Now, you know, he, he's doing this over a process which is going to take your entire life. I was in a, um, a while back, my wife and I, back when we used to go to church, were in a, a service where the pastor said that. And, and the thing about this particular pastor was he's like he almost is there with it, with, with the grace message. He's almost there. Um, and he has these moments where he just kind of like reverts back. And this is, that's what he said. He was talking about, sanctification. And he was like, well, uh, he's like, there's a process known as sanctification that goes on until the day that you die. And you're, you know, you're becoming more and more holy and uh, more and more Christ-like or however he put it. And we were just like, nope, can't happen. It's got to be by blood. It's the only way sanctification happens. Um, but he had said that and uh, that's, that it has to be that. And if we're going to teach any form of, you know, obedience to be blessed, law observance, anything like that, it has to be because we're in some kind of a vulnerable state with God. It pretty much has to be that. It can't be secure. You can't be secure. It's got to be something where you're you're working for to achieve this, whether it's you're achieving God's favor or you're achieving blessings or whatever it is. You're achieving heavenly rewards, but it's got to be some kind of position of insecurity. Um, but the Son of God doesn't afford that. Um, when you when you actually preach the authentic Jesus that we see in the New Testament and that we know, we know him. Um, you know, we don't have to read the Bible to know him. We know him because we know him. Um, but but when we preach the authentic Jesus, it just, again, it's, it's like a nuclear bomb goes off in religion. And nothing works when you preach that. No, absolutely nothing works. And I, I think that that's why he's mentioned so little is because of that. He's, he's inconvenient. Um, he is a stumbling block to... Uh, hundreds of years of traditions and theologies and deeply held beliefs that have never been in scripture. You know, he's, he's a stumbling block to all of that. So this is probably another one of those things, the plan of God, the will of God, uh, probably another one of those things. We can make up anything we want. We can say God's plans are this or that, or the plan of God was this, the will of God is that, or is this God's will? Is that God's will? We can do anything we want with those words until we go to the New Testament. And we see that again, these both have to do with the son of God. And um, one, you have done, you've done the will of the Father when you believed in Jesus. And as far as the plan of God, and at least in my opinion, by reading the scriptures, the plan of God was that Christ came and saved you. That was his plan. There's his plan. That's his plan. Um, is it, is, does he have plans beyond that? Well, he, he's not really talked about that way in scripture. It's not really spoken of that way. So if we're speaking of him that way, that's, that becomes an opinion then, because we don't really have any verses that say that. We don't really have anything in the text that says that. Um, so I hope that's, you know, to me, that's, that's less anxiety. Again, that's less anxiety. Um, you know, and I, I guess you just tell me what you think about this, but here's something else that I would worry about. And I, I still do, incidentally. Like, this is something that's hard to vanquish. Um, but here's something I used to worry about is, uh, am, 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 I, am I doing what I should be doing? Uh, that that kind of a question, and it really goes back to this: the the plan is this God's plan? Is this, is this the will of God? And it kind of goes back to that. But what about just the generalized question: Am I doing what I should be doing? Um, should I really be working this job? Should I be, you know, should I have bought this house? You know, just questions like that. Like, like, should I have married this person? You know, whatever the big question might be. Um, am I sure I'm doing what God wants me to do? Uh, again, I, as far as what I see in the New Testament. Uh, and of course, this is me saying this based on what I see in the New Testament. I can promise you, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. 
Um, his will was that you look to his son and believed in him, which you did uh, once by faith through grace. Um, you did that. So you, yes, you are. You are absolutely in the will of God. As far as his plan, well, that was his plan. His plan was to send Jesus to, to, to save us. So, you know, our, I, I'm not sure... You know, and that's another thing. I talk about this with my wife a lot. You know, as far as like, is there any situational version of that though? Can we actually go against what God has planned for us? Guys, I really don't think so. We're slaves of righteousness. Uh, the, the same chapter that says that in Romans, that's Romans chapter six, it calls us slaves of righteousness, also refers to us as God's slaves. It's a negative word. And I understand that. The reason Paul is using that is to show that there's a compulsion there. Um, we do the will of God from our hearts. It's not... Um, it, it, he's using that word because it's such a strong word. And it means that we are actually, again, we're compelled in that direction. Righteousness is what we do. Um, it's God who works in us and through us to accomplish his good purpose, is what Philippians says. Uh, so wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're in the will of God. Um, in my opinion, again, the plan of God was that, again, that Jesus came. Uh, so are you doing the right thing? You know, is that is that the question, I guess? Is that a, is that a valid question? Am I, am I doing the right thing? Is this what God wants me to do? I think yes, for the child of God. My opinion on it. I think I think it's, I think the Christian life's a lot easier than 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 we than we've been taught. I really think it's a lot easier than that. I think that it's we're in Christ. We've done the will of the Father. Um, I think that if God wants me to have this job or wants me to buy this house, I think He's going to work in me and through me to accomplish that. I'm not sure how much of a <laughs> of a pull I have with it. You know. Um, I've, I've had plans. I'll tell you what, me, my plans, I've had plans that I, I really thought were like, you know, this is all going to work out and everything. And it just ends up not. And it ends up being something different, sometimes something better or sometimes something not. Um, what I constantly say to my wife is I'm not, I'm not steering the ship here. It's just, it's evident to me. I'm not steering the ship here because <laughs> every time I, 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 you know, I, I do that, um, it's either it doesn't go how I, I wanted it to go or it goes, you know, I don't know. It, just, it doesn't seem like I'm in control. Um, you know, that's kind of what I what I get. So I'm like, I think I can take that pressure off myself and say that I'm not, I'm really not steering the ship. I'm not. Um, something I, I repeat a lot in to myself and with my wife is when talking about when we have a situation come up that we really just don't know what to do. Um, what I say is God's a good father and he knows what he's doing. Um, I say that all the time. I say it for my own benefit a lot. I'll be like, he's a good father. He knows what he's doing. Um, I don't know what he's doing here in this. I wish I did. I would like if he was a details guy. He isn't. He never has been a details guy. Um, we go back to the Old Testament. He had everyone on the edge of their seat. The New Testament, he's a little, he fills in the details. Um, but for the better part of the existence of humanity, he's, he's kept everyone in the dark, never explained himself. He's not famous for explaining himself. He doesn't like, I don't know if he doesn't like doing that or if he just doesn't do it, uh, whatever the reason being. Um, explains himself in the New Testament. He reveals himself through his son, but not in the Old Testament. Uh, he was very distant, <laughs> very, um, um, you know, he sometimes very short on words, sometimes very long-winded, but either way, he didn't really make any sense to anyone, I don't think. Um, so uh, maybe on purpose. But regardless, uh, you know, end up finding myself and that's in that kind of kind of just thinking that, you know, and just saying to God, you know, you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing here. So I'm just kind of along for the ride, uh, to be honest. You you know what you're doing here. So um, but anyway, that, that's my thoughts on all that. The plan of God, the will of God, um, how to how to kind of navigate a little bit in that, at least how I do. I mean, it's, I'm not like a perfect example or anything, but just just how kind of how I do. Uh, just understanding what's in Scripture and, and going back to understanding that everything um Everything written is about Jesus, and that's how we, at least how I um, view the the entirety of scriptures. This was all about Jesus, so um, not a lot of room for fear, not a lot of room for anxiety that way, at least about about us and our salvation and our um, being in Christ and all of that. And um, are, am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? No, we're, I think so. I think so. So my thoughts on it, but um, thanks so much for tuning in, guys. I know it's kind of late. Uh, I know it's kind of late tonight, so thanks for so much for just tuning in and just uh, hanging out and listening for a little bit. Really appreciate that. Um, tomorrow, we will be on again at 6 p.m. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about just yet. Uh, not sure yet. Um, if you have anything, just shoot it to me in a message, and we can certainly talk about it. So if not, I'll, um, I'll, I'll be thinking throughout the day tomorrow, and we'll come up with something, okay? So um, have a great evening, guys. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.